Dr. Isaac Boye, nice to have you in the studio. I hear you're moving to South Africa, so it's all good? <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's all good. I would like to move to South Africa <laughs> later in my life and spend some time here. That's wonderful. Well, the topic that we discussed today is doing African Christian theology, and I want to read you something that I actually read about uh, recently, and I think it will add uh, a lot of value to the conversation. Uh, it is actually uh, from uh, uh, a theologian by the name of Joel Carpenter, and he says the following. He says, African higher education growth have been rapid uh, in the last few years. Uh, and then he says, uh, it actually doubled up until the year 2000. And when we look at this topic, uh, maybe we can start by asking the question, what is the difference between a normal definition of theology and African Christian theology when we look at it? The word theology comes from two Greek words, theos meaning God and logos meaning discourse. So theology simply means a discussion, a discourse or the study of things about God. Who is God? What has he done? All this go into the idea or definition of theology. But the fact of the matter is that any kind of reflection about God that is theology is done within a context. Nobody does theology in a vacuum. And so depending on the kind of context that one is doing the theology for, we get different names. For example, if somebody is using the Western worldview and Western cultural perspective to make reflections about the word of God or God himself, then the person is doing theology for the Western context. And we may say that that is Western Christian theology. Similarly, for an African context, one will have to use the African sociocultural worldview as the lens for reflecting upon God and his word. So simply put, African Christian theology is a reflection on the word of God based on African sociocultural and religious perspectives. And it is the African sociocultural and religious perspective that distinguishes African Christian theology from other kinds of theology. So as I indicated earlier, theology is done within a context and the context determines which kind of theology one is doing. Definitely the kind of theology that one will do for Africa, even though it may have some global perspective, will also have some peculiarities and that makes it African Christian theology. Absolutely, Thank absolutely. A lot of people have the idea that theology was only introduced in Africa with the missionary efforts in the 18th century, but that isn't so. Uh, when was theology introduced into Africa? Actually, the history of theology in Africa can be traced to Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. But even before that time, when you read Genesis, the book of Genesis, you realize that Abraham, for instance, moved to Egypt. And for that matter, through him, the Egyptians came to know about God. Later, his descendants also moved there. But I'm not going to go as far back as the Old Testament, because at that time, the church had not been inaugurated as we have today. So I'll trace it to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit baptism came upon the, believe, upon the disciples, you realize that there were a lot of people from Africa, places like Egypt, Libya, and other places who were in Jerusalem. When they came back, they came back to introduce the word of God to their people. And as they did that, they began reflecting upon the word of God from an African cultural perspective. And that is when African Christian theology began. So you realize that in the early church, there were a number of places in Africa which became centers of theological discourse. For example, Alexandra in Egypt was a major theological center. Before the Acts chapter 2 experience, the Bible had been translated. That was the first translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, and we call that version the Septuagint. The translation was done in Alexandra. And when Christianity 
was introduced into Africa. We had people, such fathers like Oregon, we had people like Augustine of Hippo mm. and mm. Irenaeus. All mm. these people were Africans. And so it is not true that African Christian theology or theology in general or Christianity was introduced in the 18th century or uh, 15th century during the missionary mm. era. Mm. No, Christianity was here already. And so one African theologian will say that the missionaries did not introduce God to mm. Africans, but God was already here and he, he brought them to help spread the gospel in a way that will make it more meaningful to Africans. Thank you. That is a very good answer. And m maybe the next question should be with what mindset did missionaries introduce Christianity in, uh, into Africa? Uh, and what was their approach to the missionary task or to ministry? The early Christian missionaries who came from the West to Africa, they came with a mindset that Africans had no spirituality, they had mm. no, no religion. Africans were superstitious. Africans were barbaric. In a nutshell, they had a very negative view about African people and their culture. Therefore, when they came, they came with an approach which was very uncompromising to African traditional life and culture. And I would like to mention a few of such. Mm, please do. One of the things that they did was that whenever they baptized a convert, an African convert, they made sure they gave the person what they refer to as a Christian name. And they were trying to create the impression that the African indigenous name was not holy enough for someone to mm. use to be a Christian or to use and be acceptable to God. And so people were taking names such as Paul, Isaac, people were taking names that we can trace from the Bible. Others were also taking European names. Mm, mm. When you do that, you change somebody's name or you add some other name to the person's name, you realize that you are, tra you are trying to change the person's identity. Yeah. Yet they went ahead, Africans also embraced that. Later, we realized that one did not have to change his or her name <laughs> before becoming a Christian. Another thing that we can talk about is the fact that they thought that African traditional society was polluted and for that matter, whenever they had converts, they built Christian communities for them. In Ghana, we refer to that as Salems. Mm. So they took people to the Salems and separated them from their families. In Africa, that is not a good step. The reason is that Africans have a communal sense of life, meaning that one's existence is closely tied to the existence of the other people in the society. Therefore, to isolate somebody from the family, to go and live somewhere, because probably you think that the traditional society is polluted, was not good enough. Another thing that we can talk about is the introduction of formal education. Mm. The missionaries realized that they were faced with the challenge of linguistic. Mm. So a linguistics bar barrier made them aware that without breaking that barrier, their message could not be received and understood as something that is relevant to the African society. Yes. So they did very well in becoming the pioneers, learning African languages, the Bantu language, such as Swahili. Then in Ghana, we have Akan in Nigeria, Yoruba, and Igbo languages. They learned all these languages and then reduced them into writing. It was a very good step because later <coughs> it led to the translation of the Bible into indigenous languages, mm -hmm. where people could now read or understand God, hear Him, understand Him in their own languages, and even begin to pray and preach in their own languages. They went ahead, having done that, to introduce formal education. All these things were good. But when you look at it from the other side, the introduction of formal education led to the promotion of Western culture 
at mm. the expense of African traditions and culture. Yes. So at the end of the day, those who were educated segregated themselves from their families because they thought that the African traditional life was not good enough. Mm. And so we had two classes of African people, the educated ones and the uneducated ones. And it ended up breaking the ties that we have as Africans. Putting that one aside, one of the practices of Africans, traditional Africans, is polygamy. From the biblical perspective, monogamy is the ideal. Mm -hmm. But then the approach that the missionaries used was not good enough. When they came, we expected the missionaries to preach, let the people know that monogamy is the ideal so that people could have their conscience evolving the solution. But in most cases, they force people to divorce all their wives, mm. but one. Now we all know the challenges associated with divorce. Once somebody divorces the wife, it is not likely that he will take care of the children. So single parenting yeah, sure. and so on and sure. so forth. All these things did not help the propagation of the gospel. Then again, they took the African mentality as uh, something that is comparable to an empty slate. I'm talking about tabula rasa mm. mentality, mm -hmm. that Africans knew nothing mm. about God. And so we are going to tell them new things. Rather, they didn't know that we already had names for the Almighty God. We already worshiped God in a way. And so they should have linked mm. what we know to what we don't know so that um, the propagation could be smooth, effective, and meaningful to Africans. Yeah, for sure. Finally, I would like to mention how they approached spirituality. Africans believe that anything that happens in the physical world has spiritual antecedents. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody is sick, for instance, even though there are some physical solutions, the person would also like to find out what is happening in the spiritual realm. But the kind of hermeneutical, pastoral, theological framework that the missionaries came with was one that did not take this thing seriously. Yeah. So at the end of the day, after introducing hospitals and orthodox medicine, they thought that was all. Mm. Not knowing that in Africa, certain diseases have the antecedent in the spiritual realm. And so they do not pay much attention to that need, that kind of need, some of the existential needs of Africa as, 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 as far as the spiritual world is concerned. Then, in terms of worship style, the kind of liturgy that they introduced, band, drumming, dancing, singing, which are a core part of the African life. And so at the end of the day, mission churches banned their members from dancing, playing of drums, um, singing, and doing all those things. But you realize that it did not go well with mm -hmm. Africans because the kind of music that was introduced, solemn music, silent, yes. with the organ. No drums. No drums. Uh, Africans. I wouldn't have had a job. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have a job, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, these things, Africans are people who want to express yes. uh, what they have externally. So uh, experiential, uh, they, they, they want to give spontaneous response to what is happening. But the kind of liturgy they introduced expected Africans to sit quietly, mm. listening to sermons sure. and so on and so forth. So all these things did not um, argue with Africans. And yes. so Africans also reacted. Yes. Uh, and what was that reaction towards the missionaries? The reactions were in form of uh, confrontations. Mm. Sometimes people confront the missionaries. It also led to a situation where people felt that Christianity was a foreign religion. Yes. And most importantly, it led to the emergence of African-initiated churches. Mm. When later, mother tongue Bibles were produced, people also began to learn the word of God in their own languages 
and especially when you read the Old Testament, you realize that there are a lot of continuities between the mm. African worldview, the African culture, and the ancient Israel culture. So people realize that we can also start our own churches. So we had African-initiated churches which were trying to find a meeting point between the biblical worldview or the Christian gospel yes. and the African culture. Yes. And a lot of these churches sprang up. But there, there was also a problem there. The problem was that some of these church leaders also went to the extreme. Some promoted polygamy. Mm. Others, too, did not have strong theological foundation. And so at the end of the day, it led to syncretisms. And it also led to um, heresies here and there. Yes. But later, all these things were refined as people became more educated mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So the main reaction was the emergence of African initiated churches. Can you tell us a bit about how African Christian theology emerged uh, in modern African Christianity? I've already indicated that mm. when Christianity was reintroduced into Africa during the missionary era, mm. the kind of approach that the missionaries used in propagating the gospel was not acceptable to Africans. Yes. So right from the beginning, when Africans were also capable of mm. reading the Bible and understanding, they began to ask the question, how can we remain Africans and yet be faithful to the Christian faith. So discussion started going on. But in modern times, we can trace African Christian theology to the period around which most African countries had independence. Mm -hmm. That is the 1950s and 60s. During colonial days, it looks like Christianity and colonialism were synonymous. And so some of the things that were going on that Africans didn't like, uh, cultural imperialism and the rest, were also found in Christianity. So after independence, the church also thought that yes. we could also have some kind of independence as far as um, Christian theologizing is concerned. Awesome. So in 1963, for instance, there was an all-African churches conference that went on in Kenya. The participants over there, probably that was the first time that um, within the academic circles, uh, some Africans were meeting to discuss some of these issues. So the scholars who met there realized that they needed a hermeneutical and theological framework mm, mm. that would take the African worldview seriously. Yes. So the discussion started. And in 1969, there was a book that came up that was uh, published. The ed one of the editors was uh, Professor Emeritus um, K.A. Dixon, the former president of the Methodist Church in Ghana. Mm. He was mm. one of the editors. That book came up. And since then, a lot of theologians have also published, they have discussed a lot about African Christian theology. One can think of John S. in BT. Yeah, one sure. can think of Bolaji Idou. Mm -hmm. One can think of Kwame Bediaku and a whole lot of people. And Dr. Isaac Bohe. <laughs> Dr. Isaac <laughs> Bohe was also <laughs> contributing his part. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, Doc, so they, that is what you can see. There seems to be the understanding that, that African Christian theology and black theology are synonymous. They're the same. Is that so? African Christian theology and black theology are not the same. They are different in some ways. In the case of African Christian theology, it was a reaction to the missionary approach to ministry, mm -hmm. where they did not take the African worldview and cultural traditions seriously. Africans wanted to contextualize yes. Christianity. Mm -hmm. That led to African Christian theology. But in the case of black theology, which began in America in the southern part of Africa. Mm, it mm. was an opposition or a reaction to the apartheid mm. and discrimination against blacks. Mm. So the point is that they were all developed in different um, contexts and different situations led to their emergence. Mm, One mm. 
wanted to contextualize Christianity because people realized that the Western approach to Christianity in Africa was not working. Then the other, because of segregation, because of um, violence against blacks, yes. apartheid, and so on, that led to black theology. Mm. So they came from different contexts and with different um, purposes. While you speak of the difference and the diverse social cultural realities that we, are, that we have in Africa, what are some of the common beliefs and practices that are shared by Africans? I have read a number of scholars, and as you rightly indicated, Africa is a vast continent mm. with many countries. And so these countries also have their own cultural uh, differences, mm -hmm. cultural peculiarities. And so there are some scholars who believe that we don't have anything to share in common, anything in common. Yes. And so if we are going to do African Christian theology, then what will be some of the common beliefs that we mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. take note of and use? But I'm of the view that in spite of our differences, there are a few things that also unite us. Yes. And here I would like to mention a few of them. The first one is the belief in a supreme being. Mm -hmm. Before the introduction of missionary Christianity into Africa, yeah. all, African, all African societies had their own names for God. People call God Mau, others call God Nyame, others Oladume, others call him M Mungu, and so on and so forth. South Africa so Mudimu. Mudimu. Yeah. Okay. So the point is that we all share that common belief in God. Mm. Yes. So the belief in God is something that unites us, one of the things that unites us. Absolutely. Quite apart from that, we have a communal sense of life. Mm, yeah. Africans believe that um, one's existence is tied to the existence of the other people in the community. Even if you look at an issue like um, sin, yes. in the African sense, sin is not only an individual thing, yes, that's but true. we have that communal sense of mm, sin. Yeah. Therefore, the communal aspect of African belief or worldview is also another thing that unites us. It has been expressed in different languages. For example, the Ubuntu philosophy mm, of mm, mm. the southern uh, part of Africa, Centra. We also have ours. We say, I am, because I'm related to somebody by blood. I exist because other people also exist. I cannot exist in isolation. Sure. These are things that have got biblical foundation. Yeah, they I agree, agree perfectly with the biblical worldview. Mm. And we can use that as a tool in theologizing. Another thing that we can talk about as something that is common to Africans is the existence of the spiritual world. Mm. As I indicated earlier, Africans believe that everything that happens in the physical realm has spiritual antecedents. Mm -hmm. So if something happens and I want to find solution to it, I also need to find what is causing it in a spiritual perspective. Sure. And then I try to find solution. Quite apart from that, we also believe in lower divinities. Mm -hmm. Lower divinities. Apart from the supreme being, there are also lower divinities. The point is that from the African political perspective, we have chieftaincy institution. And so we have the king or the chief. One does not approach the chief directly. He or she will have to do so through the linguist. Mm. Even in our homes, we take the father as the head. And normally children will like to tell the father something through their mother. So mm. there are hierarchies. As a result of that, Africans believe that um, God is also somebody that we cannot approach directly. So the sure. idea is that he has sons and daughters in the form of lower divinities mm. who are spoken to to carry our messages to God. Of course, we have um, priests who also mediate yeah, that kind sure. of relation. 
but the lower divinities are also there for the same purpose. Finally, I would like to talk about the belief in ancestors. The African traditional family system is not um, the, how do you call it, it's, it's not the nuclear family system. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, Afri Africans have the extended family system and it goes beyond parents and their children to include nephews, cousins, grandparents, and a whole lot of people. Mm. But looking at it from that angle, you realize that there are three perspectives. And I normally relate that to the church militant, believers living mm. now, church expectant, those who are here to believe, and church triumphant, those who are already gone. Linking that to the African family system, which I will later link to the ancestors. You realize that Africans believe that we have the living who are part of the family. We also have the dead, the spirit of the dead. Mm. So dead, death is a transition. Death is a transition of the person's spirit from the world of the living yeah. to the ancestral world. Yeah. So we have the ancestors part of us, we have the living, and we have the unborn or the yet to be born people, the three different parties come together to form the family. Mm -hmm. So now, we believe that we have ancestors who are watching over us, sometimes they come home, that is the belief. Mm. So it is also a common belief among Africans that in theologizing, we need to either find, we need to find out whether it has, or sorry, we need to find out whether these belief systems have continuities or discontinuities with the biblical message. Yeah, Where sure. there are discontinuities, we need to be frank, yeah. we need to discard our belief and move on. And where there are continuities, they become teaching aids mm -hmm. to help us understand the gospel very well and to apply it to our lives in a way that will make Christianity meaningful and relevant to the continent. Mm. So these are a few of the common areas that we say as Africans. That is amazing. If you look at African Christian theology, what would some of the non-negotiables or the essentials be that we can agree upon? I would like to mention at least four points. The first one is that mm. African Christian theology must be biblical. And being biblical, I'm trying to say that um, the basis of doing theology is the Bible. Of course, we know that we have general and um, special revelation. Mm -hmm. And God's general revelation, we can find the existence of God and we can learn about God from creation. Yeah. But then it is also important that whatever we do, we use the Bible as the final authority. Mm -hmm. This particular essential feature of African Christian theology is not unique to African Christian theology. Any kind of theology where it's thought must definitely be based on the Bible. Mm -hmm. We cannot theologize with any other book. Then the person is not doing theology. Yeah, you're right. I mentioned at the beginning that mm -hmm. theology is the study of God. And mm -hmm. so I can't use any other book uh, to study God, know his purpose and will. So it must be biblical and it must be based on the Bible. It means that um, the Bible should be the lens through which we scrutinize, or it should be the yastic mm. for scrutinizing the kind of theology that we formulate. Yes. And actually, it is the final authority. Mm -hmm. As a Wesleyan scholar, that reminds me of the Wesleyan mm. quadratra, mm -hmm. where Wesley says that even though we have um, about four parties in formulating theology, that is scripture, tradition, experience, and um, reason, scripture is the final, mm. even though not the only kind of um, uh, tool that we can use in formulating theology, yeah. but it is the final, meaning that uh, whenever any of the other parties or any of the other lenses disagree with the Bible, we need to use the Bible as the standard. Mm -hmm. So it must be biblical. The next one is that it must be glow cow. Here I'm combining mm. two, I'm combining two ways. It must have global nature and local, that is contextual expression as well. Some of, the, some of the issues that we deal with in theology, issues such as sin, the need to be saved, 
uh, the atonement of Christ, the finality of his atonement, and so on and so forth. These are things that we cannot compromise. Wherever we go, we go with these as essential components of the gospel. And they are not things that are related only to Afri African Christian theology. And so when talking about the global nature, we are trying to say that it, it must have some, uh, so something common mm. to share with um, theology formulated for other context, Western context, Asian context, and so on and so forth. But also important is the fact that African Christian theology must have a contextual expression. What are the issues that we need to deal with as Africans? Yeah, for sure. Is it hunger, poverty, mm. war? Is it political issues? So we need to express our theology in a way to speak to these issues. And as I indicated mm. earlier, in doing so, we have some kind of worldview within which we are giving that uh, contextual expression to Christianity. The next one is that it must be a theology of relevance. Mm. And by that I mean it must speak to African existential realities and needs. So whenever we are theologizing, we need to make sure that the kind of theology that we are doing is not abstract. Mm. <laughs> if you do theology that is abstract, hanging in the air and not touching grounds, not solving any problem, then it will not be suitable for the African continent. Of course, it will not be suitable for any society as well, because we need to theologize in a way that God's word will speak to our situation mm. and address our, our concerns, address mm. the problems that we have. So that is also very important. Finally, that is the fourth one. It must be academic, oral, and symbolic. You see, in Africa, we have high illiteracy rate. In South Africa, that might not be the case, but you go to other places and the illiteracy rate is very high. So people are not able to read. But if it is put in oral form, mm. if it is put in oral form, uh, oral theology has to do with uh, reflecting upon God's word through song, through prayers, through yes. stories, and so on and so forth. Yes. Those ones, even those who do not have um, formal education, will still be able to participate. Mm -hmm. women, children, old men, and so on and so forth. So we need to have that kind of theology. Then we are talking about symbolic theology as well, before mm -hmm. I come to academic. Symbolic theology, um, in Ghana we have what we call Adinkra symbols. Mm -hmm. They are Katra symbols. And they evolved from the Bono Kingdom. Bono Kingdom, one king of the German, the, the German people, German people, in Broland was called Nana Edinkra, mm -hmm. and he's the one who came up with these symbols, and the name is now Edinkra symbols, and all over Ghana and other parts of Africa, they are using them. These symbols are theologically, um, these symbols have theological messages. For example, I will use one or two. For, for example, there is one that we refer to as Jinyame symbol. Mm. Jinyami means accept God. So once you look at that symbol, already you have acknowledged the existence of God and yes. you have started <laughs> theologizing. Yeah. You have already started theologizing. Mm. If God exists, then who is he? Yeah. If God exists, what has he done? Mm. And so on and so forth. So symbolic theology is very important. When you go to other parts of Africa, uh, our carvings, our designs in clothes and so on and so forth, they all have something to say about who God is and what he can do. Absolutely. But that, that notwithstanding, African Christian theology should not only be oral and symbolic. Those ones are kind of theology that you can do within, but if mm -hmm. you want to also dialogue with people outside Africa, then it must also be academic. Yeah, for sure. So I mentioned that it should be academic. It should also have um, oral expression and symbolic expression. Mm -hmm. So we will use the academic dimension to dial dialogue with other people. Where we have our theology um, logically arranged, philosophically um, sound, 
and so on and so forth, written whether in English or in some other language that we can use to communicate with the uh, people who are outside so that we can also theologize with them. Yes. Theology shouldn't be done in isolation. We need also to dialogue with other theologians from other places. And it is through the mm -hmm. academic uh, dimension or the academic aspect of our theology that we can do that. So the point, therefore, is that in our universities or in our seminaries, whilst we are doing academic uh, theology, we must also promote oral, where we use our ma mother tongue and do mother tongue theologizing and yeah. also move ahead to promote our symbol, symbols and the kind of theology that they teach. So basically, these four, uh, it must be biblical, it, it must be local, having global and contextual or local expressions, mm -hmm, yeah. it must be relevant, and it must not only be academic, but also have symbolic and aura dimensions. These are the things that I believe are non negotiable essentials when it comes to uh, theologizing for the African continent. What, what would your encouragement be and, and what would you say uh, in a word of encouragement to African theologians? First of all, we need to acknowledge that Africa has now become the heartbeat mm. of world Christianity. Christianity is now very strong in Africa and it has become an African religion. It is a religion that we have embraced. Therefore, Africans have a high stick in contributing. No, therefore, Africans have a key responsibility in contributing mm. to theological discourse globally. As a result of that, we need to encourage ourselves. Therefore, I'm encouraging young up and coming enterprising theologians those who are already doing theology in one way or the other, mm. to work hard to come out with materials that take the African worldview seriously and at the same time address concerns of the African people. In doing so, it is very important that in, uh, as we try to bring in the African worldview, we also need to guard against syncretisms. Other than that, at the end of the day, <coughs> we will put two religions, African traditional religion, yeah. uh, together with Christianity and think that mm. uh, we are doing uh, African Christian theology. Yet, it will be two different religions put together. Yeah. So as, um, a, as a tool or as a guide, what we need to do is we need to understand the African worldview very much, very well, and we also need to understand the biblical worldview and the gospel very well. Understanding these two components very well will help us to be able to come out with areas of continuity mm. and discontinuity. So that where we realize that as for this aspect of African life and belief, it contradicts the gospel. Mm. We should be honest enough to educate our people on that and put that aside. And other places where we believe are not contradicting the gospel must be developed and promoted. Yeah, no. I also want to say that, I also want to encourage African Christian theologies, sorry, I also want to encourage African Christian theologians to take the issue of mother tongue theologizing very seriously. Mm. As a preacher, I've been writing my s sermons in English. And in most cases, you go to the church, you want to preach in your local dialect, I speak Bunuchi in Ghana. I want to preach either in Bunuchi, Asantichi, or whichever local dialect. You realize that there are a lot of theological terms that I cannot find mm. the equivalence in my language. So in my PhD thesis, I decided to create some of uh, these theological terms. I introduced about seven of them in my PhD thesis. It is an area is it, is it words like perichoresis and uh, theological words like that? Yes, I introduced one like for the prep Christology. Well, the okay. for the prep is the, 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 the local term. It means once for all sacrifice. Mm. Yes. I introduced uh, Nyamekrati as for Christology. Mm. And the Nyamekrati as for aspect is the one in my local uh, language. 
it, 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 I was using that to talk about um, the dual nature of Christ. And mm -hmm. so the incarnation is also there. I, <coughs> I talked about um, Ahumbambo Christology. Ahumbambo means um, protection. So mm. the protection that we get from Jesus' um, yeah, atoning yeah. sacrifice. I talked about Ahumfadie ne Ayarisa Christology. Ahumfadie ne Ayarisa Christology. And I'm talking about deliverance and healing, or healing and deliverance, mm. and a whole lot of uh, others. I believe that it is an area that African Christian theologians need to develop. Um, I'm a translator, and so I know that sometimes it is important to create the term. Once you introduce into yeah. you introduce it to the people, it becomes part and parcel, and you move along with it. Without that, most of the things that we say can only be explained in a way, and it will not help to have the complete meaning carried to our people. So my final ways are that um, we need to also uh, take the issue of mother tongue theologizing very seriously. And I believe some other day we can talk about that one too. No, that is, thank you that very is much. a very, very interesting topic. Well, Dr. Bering, thank you so much for being with us. I know this is not the last time. And uh, as soon as you move to South Africa, we'll get you into the studio again. Yes. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> but thank you so much for spending time with us. You've been an absolute blessing. You're welcome. I'm also highly humbled by the opportunity given to me to be in the studios too. It's our absolute pleasure. Thank you.